putting it through the uh, filter like that. But we don't use any uh, uh, diatomaceous earth or DTE, which is basically tiny, uh, tiny skeletons, you know, that like sand. Uh, that that that's been uh, proven to be a health hazard if you consume it. Now, if you're using your filters, you're not consuming it. But it is non-renewable, and it is finding it into your landfills, and so you're putting a hazardous substance out there. And uh, if uh, I mean, it, it'll insects consume that, they die because it's you know tiny, sharp things. But we, do, we use some plate frame filtration, but the vast majority of the beer clarification is, that we do is done with centrifuges. We spin the solids out of it. Uh, so we use a lot more centrifuging, so then you're not putting the beer through that extra step in the process of a filter or anything like that. And no isoglass. So our beer is technically vegan. Yeah. Can you tell, tell everybody what that means? Yeah. Oh, so isoglass, like fish fossil, I guess? Fish bladder. Fish bladder. Yeah. Yep. It's, a, it's, a, it's an organic material found in fish bladders that naturally attracts uh, the dissolved proteins in beer that cause hazing. So if, if brewers add that at the, uh, in the fermentation process at the end, it can help clarify the beer. <coughs> yeah. What's that called? Isinglass. I-S-I-N-G-L-A-S. Yeah. yeah, and that's, so you'll hear sometimes uh, like an internet rumor that this beer has fish guts in it or something like that. It's not an ingredient in the beer. It's something that's that used as a filtration agent. Pasteurization? Pasteurization, yeah. We, we yeah. don't use any pasteurization except for uh, we have an inline pasteurizer for barrel-aged beers. Um, so what that is, uh, as the beer is going through a stainless steel little pipe on its way into the bottle, we flash pasteurize it in that little tube because barrel-aged beers, uh, they pick up a lot of bugs from wooden barrels that can cause some bad reactions down the, down the line. But we don't pasteurize any of our packages or kegs or anything like that. Um, Ken feels that that raising of temperature uh, in pasteurization process uh, accelerates the aging process too much and you're damaging the beer before you package it. So that's why we uh, do uh, cold, we do a, 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 we call it a quality hold on all of our beers for 14 days before it, once it's packaged in and before it goes out to the market in a temperature controlled area when it undergoes tests just about every day on each batch that goes out. It's all refrigerated and it's unpasteurized beer it needs to be refrigerated constantly. So we pay a lot for uh, refrigerated rail cars and refrigerated trucks to ship the beer to our wholesalers. We pay for all the freight for, for all of our distributors. So you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that. You'll hear, uh, yeah, you'll hear a lot of uh, freight charges from a lot of other suppliers, but we're insisting that it's cold all the time. I don't think we can talk our distributor network into footing the bill for that, so we're going to take care of that. But we do require our distributors to store the beer under the temperature conditions that Steve's. So no pasteurization means it has to be refrigerated or it'll be aging that much quicker. That's why it's so important that you know we keep that beer cold because once we get to the warm temperature, the the aging process is accelerated. Yeah, it's a great question. What pasteurization is, though, I mean, not just talking about Sierra Nevada, is uh, exposing the beer to heat to kill any bacteria that may have gotten in it from your packaging equipment or anything after it's left the fermenter. What's the ideal temperature to heat it up to? Um, do you know what? I think I, I can't tell you exactly, but I think it would be about 140, the temperature at which bugs are killed. Yeah. It varies with how long you're doing it, too. So flash pasteurization yeah. will be a shorter time, higher temperature. Whereas okay. if you're, you're cooking it longer, you can keep it lower. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's just like they tell you to cook your food to 140 or 170 to kill anything that might be on there. Just tease it with a match. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> He touched back on the, uh, you said you guys add yeast so that it can eat some oxygen? Yeah, our, bottle, our beers. Are you uh, bottle some conditioning? Of, yeah, sure. some of our beers are, are bottle conditioned, uh, pale ale being one of them. So 
post, well, as the beer is being packaged, we add a little dosage of, of yeast to the beer, uh, which then, uh, I guess, you know, would uh, create a little more CO2, uh, probably a little higher alcohol, and then uh, would essentially eat any residual oxygen in the bottle. So it's, a, it's another little fermentation that happens inside yeah, the secondary package. fermentation. But something like pale is not 100% bottle condition, right? I mean, it's meaning you pre-carbonate it before that last bottle conditioning, or is it going into the bottle, yeah, it's zero volumes of CO2? No, no, it's, it's, uh, it's naturally carbonated coming off of the fermentation process. Mm -hmm. And then, so if you get from the draft, draft pale ale, which is not conditioned like packaged pale ale, and actually the volumes of CO2 are a little bit less. It's a little bit less carbonated because that bottle conditioning or can conditioning adds a little bit of carbonation. But uh, when, when yeast uh, is doing its thing, when it's consuming any residual sugars in there and cleaning up the beer, it's also consuming any oxygen. Yeast will consume oxygen and produce carbon dioxide. So when you're brewing, when you're about to begin fermentation, you generally have to apply a given amount of oxygen to help trigger that fermentation because yeast likes that when it gets going. So that's why um, it'll consume that. And in this case, where they're trying to utilize that to achieve better stability in the long term, it kind of munches on that and then helps eliminate some of that oxygen. Which is yeah, and for the like longest time, I thought they were putting a little dose of yeast in every little bottle. <laughs> but it goes in. Uh, it's it's, yeah, so it goes from the from the uh, fermenter um, through the centrifuges and everything, and then into what we call a bright beer tank, and then it gets pumped over to packaging to another larger tank that feeds the packaging line. So the the, the conditioning yeast is added in that big tank before the packaging line. So it's all uh, the right amount in this tank and uniform throughout every package, except for. Uh, when we were experimenting with some uh, so with some funky yeasts and some bacteria, when we made that Brux, then Ken actually invented a machine that did just that. He didn't want to have this uh, Britannomyces get loose in his building, so he made a machine that would dose each little bottle. He called it the inseminator. <laughs> <laughs> And then he gave that machine to uh, to uh, Vinny from Russian River. Yeah, that was our collaboration with Russian yeah. River. <laughs> By the way, if you guys see any Brux in the market, it's tasting uh, spot yeah, on right real. now. So, what's and up? They finally changed the the Brux. Uh, I, I think it's delicious. Uh, right six months ago, it was awesome. It, it wasn't bad. It was just it was I, the, there was never much bread in it. No, well, the one I had was yeah, it's not uh, funky. Really like sour. It's it not really funky. I think it's it was uh, going to be like champagne. Yeah, thing. more yeah. some apple and pear. And, yeah. Yeah. I think it's delicious. Great questions. Um, any other questions? Thank you for having us. Thank you, yeah. thank you guys. Thank you.